So the fine folks at Squarespace have agreed to sponsor a couple of videos per month for this month, next month, and the one after, so we must be doing something correct. But <laughs> with that said, what is Squarespace? Well, if you haven't picked it up by now, Squarespace is a nice, easy-to-use website builder, and I'm going to show you how easy in this edit of my website that I'm doing. So I'm going into the British Ironclads page, and there's five pictures uploaded there at the moment. I think I did these as part of a test a few months ago. So I'm going to go into Edit, I'm going to select the pictures. You can see I've got some pictures there. Then I'm going to pull up my menu of my well, my second album of British Ironclad. Select all the ones of HMS Devastation except for that duplicate. Drag them in. And there is a file size limit, so I'll have to downsize some of those pictures and re-upload them at a separate time. But notice that doesn't cause the upload to fail. It just means the ones that are too big don't upload. So all the others upload. And I'm leaving this one running purely in real time so you can see how quickly it handles things. Now, obviously, some of these things will be um, mitigated by your own internet speed, but you can see the interface itself and the way of doing it is an absolute doddle. So I'm just checking there to see if some of my specifically named and dated ship pictures made it in, and some of them did. So, so then I can select this one because I know the date 1873, and HMS Station 1873 goes in. That becomes uh, the title or the caption for that picture. And this one's at sea, so I can label it at sea. That's done. I can scroll down. Pictures are now there and all happily titled. Now, bearing in mind, I do have to investigate perhaps later on formatting because some of these you can see they're a little bit cut off because they're all to the same format. But if I open them in a new tab, the whole picture is actually there to enjoy. So if you want to build a website for whatever purpose, then head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And if you decide to stick with it, then go to squarespace.com forward slash Drakinafel. And that'll give you 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So once again, thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and let's get on with the show. So, not content with giving you Drax worships, the wonderful people on Patreon have voted for what are Drax's top five best engineered ships of all time, or at least for the period that the channel covers. So, that's what we're going to be discussing today. And we are going to look at a curated list, because if you ask me to list my best engineered ships, it would be a lot, lot longer of a list. And also, you know, some nations have a better track record of producing well-engineered ships than others, so it would be a somewhat weighted list. But since we are limited to five... I'm going to take some of some choices from my top five across the board from different nations and see how we'll stack up there. And of course, this is a subjective list because it is my choices based on my experience as both a naval historian and as an engineer. So I suspect that other naval historians who perhaps have different backgrounds or you yourselves who may value different things as priorities over my engineering background might come up with the different choices and that's entirely fine put your own top five lists in the comments below It'd be interesting to hear so in no particular order we're going to start with one that just about falls within the scope of the channel as she did at one point serve as a troop ship and therefore was involved in naval activities and that would be brunel's ss great eastern now, for almost anybody with a background in engineering, with perhaps the exception of the astronautics and aeronautics engineers, SS Great Eastern is up there as a shining example of engineering achievement. Not necessarily great commercial achievement, but as an example of what someone can do when they put their mind to it, she is a stunning accomplishment. And you've got to bear in mind just where she sits in the timeline, which makes it even more of an engineering accomplishment. She's ordered, built, launched, and commissioned in the 1850s. So she doesn't predate iron warships. Iron warships had been tried before this. They hadn't really worked out, and it would only be the armoured iron warships of the 1860s that started the trend of armoured vessels. So the previous ships had just had iron hulls instead of wooden hulls. But still, Great Eastern predates the introduction of viable iron warships into any navy, and she does so on a scale that makes even HMS Warrior seem small. Any picture or illustration of her that has other ships alongside her 
essentially turns any ship up to and including full-on sail frigates into something that more resembles a ship's launch. She is absolutely gargantuan to the point, as I made when I did the five-minute guide on her, that the Royal Navy would not have a ship in service that exceeds her displacement or size until the 1910s. So for well over half a century, there was no warship on the planet that exceeded her dimensions or displacement. And, well, there wasn't any ship on the planet that exceeded her dimensions or displacement for a good few decades, although ocean liners did start to overhaul her towards the end of the 19th century. And, of course, she's built by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, a man who never does anything by halves. He'd already built what was, at the time of commission, the largest passenger ship in the world with the Great Western, which was also one of the first steamships to complete the transatlantic voyage and managed to grab the Blue Ribbon. Uh, literally less than 24 hours after the first winner of it got got it. He then built the world's first iron-hulled, screw-driven steam liner in the form of SS Great Britain, which was another example of his remarkable engineering prowess because SS Great Britain ended up surviving both being beached in a storm and then being abandoned in the Falklands for almost a century before being brought back and restored to the state that she's in today. He also built a number of bridges that were the world's largest of their type at the time, and pretty much all of them are still standing. Again, testament to the fact that he could really design things to last. But then along comes Great Eastern. Now, fair enough, Great Eastern does horrifically bankrupt pretty much anybody who ever touches her because she is an absolutely colossal beast, and no one can quite figure out what to do with her. Brunel's built her to be able to sail to Australia and back, taking into account the inefficiencies of steam propulsion at the time. So she's got sail power, steam power, and the steam power is divided between screw propellers and a pair of giant paddle wheels. But for what she's designed for, she does actually work. It's just that the market that she was designed for turns out to be not quite as lucrative as everyone had thought. But still, one, in the 1850s, You've turned out a ship that displaces over 30,000 tons, which is you know impressive enough, which also doesn't fall apart at the first sign of trouble. It's then able to withstand a boiler explosion that turns one of its funnels into basically a steampunk ballistic missile. And not only does it survive that, where a number of ships have been destroyed by boiler explosions, it keeps on trucking because apparently something that would be considered a major engineering casualty in most other ships is more of a medium-scale annoyance to the Great Eastern. She also proved capable of transporting over 3,000 people at a time, which had never been done before, over 2,000 of which were troops heading to Canada to reinforce Canada in the event that the US tried anything during the American Civil War, which you know was a show of force in and of itself and that's how she entered the naval world because there are pictures of Great Eastern with cannon aboard and most of those date from this period when she was an armed troop transport they just left a bunch of the cannon there. She survived a hurricane that was strong enough not only to sink several dozen other ships in the vicinity but also one that was strong enough to destroy almost every single means of propulsion she had, despite her three different methods of propulsion, as well as bend the rudder like a pretzel, but the hull remained completely unbowed, and all it took was a jury-rigged propeller, and she was able to carry on. And that wasn't the end of it. She'd then go on to strike a rock that ripped a hole in her hull that was long enough to easily th sink the ship if the inner hull had been breached, and indeed is comparable in size to the rent in the hull that actually did sink the Titanic almost half a century later. But as far as Great Eastern was concerned, she was so strongly built that although in theory the rock that she hit should have ripped open both the outer and the inner hull, her outer hull and the beams between the outer and inner hulls were so strong they basically lifted the ship up away from the rock even as it ripped through the outer sections and thus everybody on board felt a slight jolt thought they'd hit a sandbank meandered off back to a port and then when they arrived in port they thought oh, why is the ship listing slightly and then they sent a diver down and oh yes there was a sucking great hole in the side of the ship of a scale that would have sunk pretty much anything else but no the great eastern was just mildly inconvenienced once again 
Then, of course, she went on to her more famous role as a cable layer, being the only ship in the world capable of taking a full-length transatlantic cable, because splicing those things in, mid, in the mid-Atlantic is not a fun job. And, of course, Admiral Sartorius of the Royal Navy wanted to get his hands on her and use her as a gargantuan ram. Note that he, at no point did he propose actually refitting the Great Eastern in any particular way in terms of putting a massive armoured ram bow on the front, just a notional one. It was more the case of she was built so strongly and she was so massive that any warship that she ran over, bearing in mind that the largest warships in the world were about one third of her displacement, would probably have just been crushed and mangled beneath her, regardless of whether she had a ram bow or not. And then, of course, towards the end of her career, when she was finally to be broken up, she proved so tough it took a year and a half to break the ship up, because she just would not die quietly. The fact that she was always hemorrhaging money through people taking somewhat ill-advised business decisions with her is no reflection on her status as a hugely well-engineered vessel and a marvel of engineering in and of itself. And one always wonders what could have happened, you know, what could have been, given that by the time that she was broken up in the late 1880s, engine technology had advanced far beyond the capabilities of the engines she'd been built with, you know, if somebody with a lot of money had managed to get their hands on a new set of engines and replaced her existing power plant, remove the paddle wheels, replace the screw propeller with one of an improved design, and then replace all the machinery, thus vastly freeing up space and displacement within the ship, what could she have done then? You know, could being perhaps converted into the world's first super ocean liner? Or something to that effect. Or as one thing I keep speculating on for maybe doing for an April 1st video, what could have happened if someone had taken up Admiral Sartorius's suggestion and in the mid 1860s bought up the Great Eastern and then we watch her go through numerous iterations and refits through it all the way through into the interwar period. A complete random fantasy but one to consider because to be honest, given Brunel's engineering, she almost certainly would have lasted and given good service in that entire time period. Our next candidate is the German battlecruiser SMS Seidlitz, or Seidlitz, well, I've heard it pronounced both ways. In any case, you might look at her and think, there's a few minor engineering issues with her. I mean, she's a ship that's built in the 1910s and she still has cross-deck firing and she still is only armed with 11-inch guns. This is true, but she was relatively well protected, relatively quick as long as you gave her good coal. But where she comes in as a very well-engineered ship is not to do with her offensive capabilities or indeed her speed but more in just the sheer durability that the ship exhibited and that's before we get to Jutland I mean bearing in mind at Dogger Bank she had her two aft turrets burned out near enough completely destroyed by some slightly dodgy ammunition handling practices but whilst pretty much all the crews in those turrets were lost Thanks to some heroic actions by men down in the magazines, she herself was not lost and she was able to make her escape. So the fires didn't cause a compromise in the ship's ability to keep going, which was uh, quite important considering that a good chunk of the British battlecruiser fleet was on her heels. And then having been repaired, she then was mined. She survived that. She was repaired. And then she was sent to Jutland, which of course is where she takes the famous battering, starting off with 13.5-inch shells from Queen Mary, which she subsequently helps to destroy. Then she's hit by a torpedo. Then she's hit by a whole mix of shells from the Grand Fleet. Then she's hit by... Well, she's also hit by 15-inch shells from the 5th Battle Squadron shortly before that. She's hit by further shells during the evening and during the night, during various actions with both British battlecruisers and with the Death Ride. And despite taking this absolute pasting, she's not only still afloat, but she's also actually, by about two-thirds of the way through the periods of fighting, actually one of only two German battlecruisers able to respond to the orders that are being given. All the others have been forced to slow down through varying degrees of damage, which, you know... Although pictures 
don't eat well they don't survive they probably weren't taken considering the low light but it does give this rather amusing mental picture of Sadlitz, you know probably at least halfway from the from the waterline up to the main deck down in the water you know pretty much becoming a semi-submersible still bravely sailing forth at near enough well not near enough full speed but at, at well above 20 knots with her as you'll recall from videos on her um convicted of drunkenness helmsman madly steering away quite happily um it just showed an insane level of durability for this ship in particular, which is ironic considering that uh, successors, the Der Flinger class, were not in anywhere like as good shape, and indeed, um, obviously Lutzow herself would end up being sunk by considerably fewer hits, although that does also illustrate the, you know, the importance of where you hit something as much as just hitting them in the first place. She also has a fair bit of luck on her side, as well as good engineering, because not only is she able to contribute to the destruction of Queen Mary, she's also a able to score the one and only hit that the entirety of the High Seas Fleet would score on the Grand Fleet when she hits HMS Colossus with a shell. Now, yes, of course, Marlborough was also torpedoed, but we're talking about gunfire here. And then, although she is succumbing by fractions to the wounds that she's taken... She manages to manoeuvre her way on her own, again with a bit of luck, because Agincourt spots her but ignores her, all the way to the Jade Estuary, where she's not quite able to clear into the harbour. She has to be lightened, but she manages to just about stay vaguely above water long enough, with the assistance of some tugs, to get into the harbour, where once she's alongside she promptly then sinks at the quayside but never mind it doesn't matter because at that point the water is shallow enough so you know just in terms of the absolute level of damage that Sadlitz takes and manages to get her crew home relatively speaking safely that just speaks to a absolutely fantastic level of engineering present within her for durability Obviously, as with any ship, there is also, as we mentioned, a degree of luck in where the shells actually hit. But there are very, very few ships on either side, outside of maybe Tiger, that take that level of pounding from enemy guns and can then walk away to tell the tale. And, of course, Tiger is a considerably larger, considerably more heavily armed vessel than Sadlitz. So it shouldn't be a surprise that Sadlitz takes her place amongst my top five best engineered vessels. Next up, we have an entry from the Marine Nationale, that is, the Navy of France. And this is the heavy cruiser Algerie. Now, Algerie is a remarkable engineering achievement on a couple of grounds. Firstly, she is, in my opinion, the best treaty-compliant heavy cruiser of the interwar period. And secondly... She got there from possibly the worst of all starts compared to other nations' heavy cruisers. So we'll cover that second bit first, because France built three sets of heavy cruisers during the interwar period. You started off with the Duquesnes, then the Soufrens, and then finally Algerie, which was a one-off. Now, keel laying between Duquesne and Algerie is only separated by approximately six years. But Duquesne and her sister ship were, quite frankly, in my opinion, as an, as an engineer, awful, awful vessels. Sure, they had the armament and the speed of a heavy cruiser, but in terms of protection, the Duquesnes, well, you think the Pensacola's a bad go and read the Duquesne statistics. The Duquesne's armour effectively seemed to exist to repel machine gun bullets and to initiate the fuses on anything larger than that. A particularly aggressive destroyer commander could probably have taken a Duquesne apart in fairly short order. And the Suffrans were not exactly a massive step up in that particular realm. But in less than six years, the French turned that around from producing some of the worst heavy cruisers ever to arguably one of the best heavy cruisers ever, at least in terms of treaty limitation cruisers. And that in and of itself is a remarkable feat of engineering. You don't see that many uh, 
utter disasters rescued so quickly when it comes to major warship builds. But the part I mentioned first about her being arguably the best treaty era treaty compliant heavy cruiser that requires a little bit more explaining now of course heavy cruisers and indeed all cruisers initially were limited to 10,000 tons and 8 inch guns by the Washington Naval Treaty and everyone had their various attempts at it so the Japanese built the Miyokos the British built the counties the Americans built the Pensacolas the Italians built the Trentos and the Triestes, and the French, as we said earlier, built the Duquesnes. Now, everyone had their own ideas how to follow on. The British basically didn't. They built a bunch of counties and then a couple of diminutives in York's and, and York and Exeter and then gave up the idea. The Japanese would go on to build the Takaos after the Miyokos and then quietly engineer the Megamis uh, and obviously build the Tones. Then the Americans built a, a series of different developments from the Pensacolas before eventually winding up with the New Orleans. But whilst the Italians decided to throw the treaty out the window when they built the Zaras, the Germans did the same with the Hippers and the Japanese had kind of ended up doing so right from the start with all of theirs. The French, along with the British and the Americans, were still actually trying to stick to the 10,000 ton limit. But that 10,000 ton limit was coming up with some fairly serious limitations because it had been designed to give a relatively balanced all-round cruiser in terms of speed protection and firepower in the early 1920s when anti-aircraft armament, amongst other things, was not considered to be an absolutely massive priority. Whereas by the middle part of the interwar period, it very much was a significant issue. So you had this dichotomy of you needed a cruiser, which had to go a fair distance, so it had to have a fair amount of fuel. It had to go fairly quickly, i.e. at least 30 knots, and in almost every case faster than that. It had to carry a main armament of 8-inch guns, usually again as a minimum eight unless you're building a diminutive like the york class and in an ideal world it also had to carry enough anti-aircraft guns and secondary guns to deal with potential attack from that vector and it had to carry enough armor again ideally to protect it from its own weapons or guns in that caliber at a reasonable battle range this was not something that any other treaty cruiser really, bar one possibly, managed to pull off. The counties managed to, in the end, get a fairly decent spread of armour protection, but that was only after they'd been refitted in what I've maintained is a suspiciously fitted for but not with armour upgrade programme. And that put them well over the treaty weight limitations. The New Orleans class had a somewhat decent level of armor protection but in an incredibly concentrated manner that left an awful lot of the hull exposed and also tended to have a rather flammable amidships courtesy of a multiplicity of aircraft aboard and as we mentioned everybody else was just ignoring the treaty entirely then enter Algerie so she has eight 8-inch guns, so a perfectly respectable heavy cruiser armament, and there's nothing particularly wrong with the guns either. She manages a battery of 12 3.9-inch or effectively 4-inch guns for her anti secondary anti-surface and heavy AA, which is in excess of what the other two competitors managed, the New Orleans and the counties in their later refit form, both managing 8 heavy AA guns. Then there's a smattering of light anti-aircraft guns, but of course, pre-war, you know, what counts as a light anti-aircraft gun is very variable and very limited. And so it's a little bit unfair to look at that aspect in the future, because obviously once you get the heavy 20mm and 40mm refits to the New Orleans and the counties, they start again going over the treaty uh, displacement limit, and Algerie doesn't get the chance to do that because of circumstances in the war. But her light AA fit of 37mm and 50 cal guns was not bad for the interwar period. 
She also, unlike the New Orleans, manages to carry torpedo launchers, or the counties carry them as well, but you know that gives her a good anti-shipping strike capability for larger targets. Her speed is respectable, she manages to clear 31 knots, so it's great, she's got the speed, she's got the firepower, but what about the protection, the big downfall of basically almost all the treaty cruisers? Well, she manages a comprehensive 4.3 inch or 110 millimeter armor belt and a fairly decent deck as well, just over three inches at certain locations. The turret armor isn't necessarily quite as thick as some, but at longer ranges, it's more than capable of dealing with most incoming eight inch gunfire at the kind of ranges cruisers were expected to fight at. So she represents an incredibly rare achievement. She's got Decent all-round protection, decent anti-aircraft fit, and heavy anti-shipping strike capability, a decent main gun battery capability, and speed. So she is actually a treaty compliant all-round treaty cruiser. Now, I mentioned with the possible exception of one other vessel, and that is USS Wichita, which is the other ship that usually comes up when arguments about what was the best treaty cruiser are made. And yes, Wichita does carry an extra gun and is a fraction faster and a somewhat greater maximum armor thickness, but she also has initial problems with stability because all of that does really kind of overload a ship that's only going to hit 10,000 tons standard displacement. And it leaves her with very, very little room for upgrades during the war. Now, that's not to say Wichita was a bad ship once they figured out how that they could address those stability issues. She was a fairly decent vessel, but as a 10,000 tonner, she did have her engineering flaws in the realms of stability, and she needed to go over that in order for those issues to be corrected, whereas Algeri did not have those stability issues, and therefore remains, to my mind, the best all-round 10,000 ton treaty-era cruiser, and given just how difficult an achievement that is, that means she has to go down in the history books as one of the best engineered ships of all time, because she manages to pull off something that literally nobody else actually managed. So we're only down to two more candidates, and the next candidate I'm going to put in is HMS Victory, Nelson's flagship. Now, the reason why she's one of the best engineered vessels of all time actually has very little to do with Nelson himself. It's more to do with the capabilities that she brought to the field, capabilities that were still front line decades after she was first launched. Now, bear in mind, we are being a little bit generous here by going with when she's launched rather than when she's laid down because that stretches things back even further. But nevertheless, when she is initially launched as a hundred and something gun ship of the line the exact number tends to vary throughout her career she actually represents an incredibly good first rate she carries a heavy battery some first rates had been hampered by not being able to carry some of the heaviest guns in their lowest gun decks so she's able to carry a, a pretty nasty punch she's very durable which is very important but she's also for a first rate fast and in fact, in heavier seas, when her larger hull frame and greater sail area allows her to maintain her speed in conditions that frigates can't, she's actually faster than a good many frigates. So you can imagine the sheer terror of various smaller ships, fifth rates and sixth rates of various points, which were captured by victory. And indeed, this actually did happen a few times. If you're a small frigate thinking, OK, well, here comes a big first-rate ship of the line. Now, if it's a third-rate, maybe you have to worry a little bit, but you can usually outsell them. But a first-rate, come on, they're, they're big, they're heavy, they're nasty, but I'm frigate, I'm going to be faster than it. And in good weather, you notice after several hours or maybe a day or two's chase, that massive, great killing machine is still there, having either slightly gained, kept pace, or maybe only fractionally fallen back. This is worrying, but hey, you're a frigate. You've, you've still got your lead. You can keep going and get to a friendly port, but then the weather starts to shift. 
and the seas get heavier and the winds get harder and you start having to shorten sail in case you blow out a mast and well you're losing speed because you're going up and down and all over the place in the waves and then you look in the background and then silhouetted against the stormy skies by a lightning flash you notice the monstrous shape of a first rate and it's closing you down oh dear that's what happens when frigates try and tangle with hms victory and hms victory goes on to take part in a number of different battles against the french the spanish and the french and the spanish put together as well as a few other people who decided to get stuck in at various points and she consistently performs well not only is she fast she's agile and as mentioned she delivers one heck of a punch She's a comprehensive all-rounder that manages to avoid almost all of the pitfalls involved with normal first-rate construction. To such a degree that when three decades or so have passed and the Royal Navy is looking to do a serial production run of first-rates, which is something that they effectively have never actually done before, and they start to draft the lines for what will become the Caledonia-class 120-gun ships of the line... They don't go with a clean slate design. They don't go with even adapting some of the theoretically more modern French and Spanish designs that have been captured and brought into service over the past, you know, half a lifetime. They go back to the lines of HMS Victory because it's about the best that they can come across and they just expand it somewhat. And so the Caledonias are basically expanded victory type ships of the line. And they will go on to be the backbone of the Royal Navy's capital ship force for several decades to follow. Now, to give you some idea of reference of just how much of an issue this actually is. Now, we have to acknowledge, of course, that the rate of ship design and technology was not advancing at quite the same pace it was during the 20th century. But nonetheless, it was advancing. So to take a 30 year old design to base your brand new design off of was still a fairly interesting step to take but if you were to say dial things back 30 years at the start of world war one and say okay well you know we need the latest and greatest in capital ship design to face off against the germans because obviously victory is a british ship so you know let's go back 30 years to what our latest and greatest capital ship was then and and take a design line off of that well you end up with hms victoria and hms sans pari which okay yes they have 16.25 inch guns but with the best will in the world nobody's designing a derivative of them in world war one that's going to be in any way shape or form considered a modern vessel unless perhaps you're building a monitor or if we go forward to world war ii and well once again we need to build the latest and greatest ship to face off against the germans or possibly the japanese wind the clock back 30 years and roughly where are we well we're looking at the orion class the first of the 13.5 inch gun super dreadnoughts which again you know maybe if you're trying to create a, a super cruiser or cruiser killer by removing q turret sticking some more machinery in and giving the whole lot a comprehensive overhaul then maybe you can make something of it but you're certainly not going to design something to take on bismarck or yamato by taking lines off of the orions and yet that is what the caledonia class represents and they prove to be very lethal but then we come forward to trafalgar and trafalgar is about 40 years after victory has been launched and where do you find victory she's at the front of nelson's column she takes on the franco-spanish fleet head on and not only does she make it through the line she effectively cripples villeneuve's flagship with a single broadside admittedly then gets tangled up with redutable which is probably one of if not the best ships in the entire franco-spanish formation when it comes to fighting close-range boarding actions but nonetheless, she managed, with a bit of help of Temeret, from Temeret, to survive that. She engages numerous other French and Spanish ships during the battle. And although her upper works and sails and masts are quite badly shot up, she needs a tow back to Gibraltar. After a refit and a bit of repair, she's able to make her own way back home. So she is a 40-year-old ship serving as a very effective flagship sailing into the teeth of the enemy and leading ships most of which are much newer than her so again if we cycle back to 
World War I and World War II, that's the equivalent of something like the 1876 HMS Inflexible somehow contriving to serve as Jellicoe's flagship at Jutland and doing a good job of it. Or one of the Duncan-class pre-dreadnoughts, say HMS Albemarle, somehow being the lead ship that is sent to go and combat Bismarck. And unlike Hood, which is considerably later than Albemarle by almost two decades, in this case, if we're using the Trafalgar analogy, Albemarle would sail up and cripple Bismarck in a single opening salvo. Now, once again, capping off that analogy with the caveat and proviso that, of course, as we said, technology was advancing a little bit faster in the 20th century, but it's a fun comparison to make. And, as mentioned, even with the slower pace of technology in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, Victory was still technically on paper an old ship and had been superseded by several design revisions in pretty much everybody's shipyard, but she was still a frontline bruiser. So that, and of course the fact she managed to stick around for the subsequent two centuries, makes her, in my mind, one of the best engineered ships of all time. And that brings us to the last entry in our No Particular Order list, and that would be the Fletcher-class destroyer. Now, the Fletchers could very easily have ended up on the opposing list to this, in the worst category, because if you look through their initial design history, compared to what they would have at the end, there were various proposals for a smaller hull that carried even more weaponry than the historic Fletch did, and there were proposals when they eventually realised that they're going to need a larger hull, again for a ship that carried absurd amounts of weaponry. So whereas the historical Fletcher carried five single five-inch guns and ten torpedoes in a pair of quintuple torpedo launchers, there were at various points design briefings that called for three quadruple torpedo launchers, so a total of 12 torpedoes. There were proposals that called for reload torpedoes to be carried. There were proposals that called for quite significant numbers of 50 cal machine guns to be carried. Various forms of depth charges and depth charge launchers as well. All sorts of things, none of which would have really helped with the ship's stability. But, as it turned out, they managed to cut through all the bureaucracy, they managed to cut through all the nonsense, and they ended up going with a large hull with the aforementioned historical Fletcher-class weapons loadout. And they also managed to incorporate a bunch of splinter-proof protection plating along the ship's hull. Now, this was a very important measure, and this is one of the reasons why they sit up there as well-engineered ships, apart from the reduction from the insane weapons, is because... One of the things the U.S. has had observed when they were finalising the design, learning from the wartime lessons from late 39 and 1940, was that destroyers obviously historically did not carry armour, but a number of destroyers had either been damaged or in some cases even partially or fully lost as a result of splinter and blast damage from bombs that had missed them, and in some cases missed them by up to 50 yards. And what was happening was that the blast and the splinters from that near miss were still punching straight through both the sides of the hull and bulkheads and causing leaks, severing lines and damaging machinery, which could either combine with other damage or cripple the ship and therefore cause other damage, which would eventually lead to the ship being lost. Now, on the Fletchers, they decided, right, well, if we're going to have the big hull, we're going to have the protection, therefore... We can also make do with some speed, but, you know, resist the temptation to suddenly start sticking extra torpedo launchers on. And you ended up with a ship that had a fairly roomy hull. It had a fairly hefty anti-surface armament. Only a very few destroyers during the war would have better. A respectable anti-ship armament in the form of its torpedo launchers. It had protection against anything other than a direct hit. Now, granted, his Fletcher class's sides were not going to stop any shell of any particular caliber, except for maybe rifle caliber bullets, but it meant that you actually had to hit the ship to do some serious damage rather than just getting splash damage in. And by not giving in to the demands of those who wanted to absolutely coat the thing in weapons from the very start, the way that the Sims class had been, 
you ended up with a ship that was not only fast, durable, and well-armed, but also had a huge amount of upgrade space. Whereas basically any destroyer that preceded the Fletchers when it went through its mid-war and then late-war upgrades had to lose either a 5-inch mount or a torpedo launcher, or in some cases both or more, in exchange for more fire control directors, more anti-aircraft guns, and so on and so forth, radar especially, most of the Fletchers were able to retain both of their quintuple torpedo launchers and all five of their five-inch guns and still receive surface search radar, surface gunnery radar, air search radar, air anti-aircraft direct and directing radar, anti-aircraft fire control directors, new and improved anti-surface gunnery directors, and of course the usual layout of 20mm and 40mm anti-aircraft cannons to supplement their five-inch guns. It was only in 1945 when some truly ridiculous anti-aircraft loadouts were being considered for destroyers that the Fletchers in some cases had to start surrendering one or two items from their original main battery and of course post-war refits would see them lose such things as well but the fact was that the Fletchers for being what are technically at least for the US Navy a pre-war design were actually able to then serve on into the cold war environment both with the u.s navy and with various other navies rather speaks to just how capable these hulls were because when you look at everybody else well to be fair the creation you know, had basically no destroyers left neither did the japanese navy but when you look across the atlantic to the royal navy when the royal navy came into its post-war environment pretty much all of the pre-war and many of the wartime destroyers were either scrapped or went into reserves. To get to a British class of destroyer that survives much p past anything like the early to mid-1950s in anything other than a reserve or training role, you have to pretty much reach mid-war production, so 1943-1944 and onwards, and even then most of them aren't viewed too favourably. You basically have to get to end of war production with things like the battles and the darings in order to get ships that reliably get through into the 1960s whereas the fletchers which started to enter service in early 1942 would actually stay in commission in the u.s navy at least until broadly the early 1970s and in some navies much later still and they'd prove their durability in wartime as well despite almost 200 vessels being completed less than two dozen were lost many of them to kamikazes but even then most fletchers that went down didn't take too many of their crew with them a lot of the time the majority of the crew were able to get away safely because even when fatally compromised it would take a while for something as tough as a fletcher to go down so for their all-round durability, their fantastic ability to take upgrades, and their incredibly long lifespan, the Fletcher class definitely tick all the major boxes for their entry on the list of extremely well-engineered ships. And they also got the last laugh in, in as much as although being succeeded by the Sumner and Gearing classes during World War II, the first major class of US destroyer built post-World War II, the Forest Germans, actually owe most of their initial design specifications to the quest for an improved Fletcher rather than an improved gearing. So that's my list of Drax's top five best engineered ships from across the world. What do you think? Do you think something else should have been on the list? Do you think one of those ships shouldn't be on the list? Or do you have your own completely different list and why? Uh, let us know in the comments below and I look forward to the discussion. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.